Hi, everybody, and welcome to today's Facebook Live. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking about canine housemate aggression and what are the prognostic risk factors. In other words, what are the factors, the um, you know situations and things that tell us whether or not these two dogs can be safe together, can they learn to get along. My name is Dr. Sally Foote. I'm a veterinarian and an animal behaviorist. I have Foote and Friends uh, Facebook page and my website where I provide online education for veterinarians, veterinary technicians, uh, dog trainers, and clients. I also provide behavior consultations as well as doing professional speaking and writing. So thank you for being here today. Um, I want to start off with uh, saying that there are that what I'm talking about today is, is a summary of this article in the JAVMA, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, that was published last year, February of 2020, by Dr. Elizabeth Feltis, uh, Jason Stoll, Dr. Megan Heron, and Dr. Lori Haig. And these are all veterinary behaviorists that took, did a, like a um, retrospective survey from Dr. Feltis's practice. Dr. Feltis has one of the first behavior specialty, behavior focused practices in Olmstead Falls, Ohio, in near suburban Cleveland. And so she went back through about 10 years of her medical records, of her behavior cases records, looking at these housemate dogs and what were some of the, um, if, were there any um, risk factors, you know, commonalities in these cases that determined outcome. Okay, so from this abstract, you can go into the full paper, three main points come out. Okay, and the um, first one is the bite level. Now, bite level for the aggressing dog, what the aggressing dog is putting onto the victim dog, but it also matters what the victim dog is putting on back to the aggressing dog. So when we're talking about bite level, we're referring to the second handout from Dr. Ian Dunbar, the uh, six bite levels of the dog. <clears throat> and so I think it's really important that we are referring to bite level and referring to the bite level as defined by this handout by Dr. Dunbar so that we're all speaking the same language. So basically what it comes down to is if the aggressing dog is biting to a level of three or broken skin onto the victim, that the aggressing dog is at a level of intensity of biting that even with behavior modification, medication, changing the environment, it is very difficult to reliably have this aggressing dog not at some time in a trigger situation or what actually in a lot of these cases it's difficult to identify all the triggers to aggression, that this aggressing dog will bite this victim dog at times again to a level three or higher because it may go higher. So as a veterinarian and a veterinary technician or shelter care worker and daycare worker, when you are seeing a dog jump up, grab, or go straight up to bite onto another dog and there's any broken skin, this is a serious, serious problem. We have some serious aggression going on here. And some of our difficulty lies in that a lot of people don't know about this bite level, you know, the bite level chart. And a lot of people don't even think a bite matters at all until skin is broken. But actually, that's when it's at the, we're now into the worst, you know, the worst ascension and the worst escalation of aggression. I'm going to go into this a bit more, but let me get through these first three points. Then I'll go into each one a little more in depth, how it relates to a housemate aggression. Second one is gender pairing. Do we have a male and a male? A male and a female? A female and a female? They spade or not spade, okay? So gender pairing matters. And lastly, size difference. And in this abstract, actually it was found that if there's anything from a three pound difference in the weight of the two dogs or greater than three pounds, the prognosis declines. So it doesn't take that much more of a bigger, let's say bully dog, a bigger aggressing dog to really increase the intensity of the bite, increase the um, degree of aggression that's going on between the two of them. Okay, um, so let's go back to what's happening in the household. 
Uh, from this survey, and I think a lot of us who do provide behavior consultations to our clients will acknowledge this, the most common um, threat, perceived threat by the dog aggressing or how that, you know, the dog behaves is, is resource guarding. So it's guarding over food, guarding over the beds, guarding over toys, guarding over furniture, like if the dogs are allowed to lay on the couch, the human bed or entrances going through doorways. And lastly, they may also aggress over access to the owner, how who's coming up to be petted first. Those are all resources to the dogs. So we get this body blocking and they come together and they stare and then they suddenly go up in a fight. So in the household, if we first of all cannot really identify clearly these multiple resource triggers, it's gonna be a lot harder to control those resources and you're gonna have more aggression. Secondly, if there are multiple resource guarding triggers, like food and all the beds and all the resting places and in and out the doorways, access to spaces, I say, it is much more difficult to create a management plan that can remove or reduce the intensities of those triggers to then get into the desensitization and counter conditioning plan. So we will have, still triggering up, we're gonna have aggressive events. Okay, so let's start talking about bite level here. Now, as a veterinarian, we learn nothing about this. <laughs> and this bite level scale has been out for a long time. Never got that ladder of aggression for the dog or like, you know, in veterinary school either. Yet on an emergency call, how many emergency veterinarians or even in a general practice also may have somebody bringing in their dog because the other dog bit and ripped the ear. There's a puncture wound or puncture wounds on the legs. And we can take care of those when they're at just puncture wounds really pretty easily in practice. That medical side of the treatment oftentimes is not that difficult or that bad. And actually a lot of times we don't even see those. If there's just a few puncture wounds on the neck or on the head or on the legs, the client may clean them out with peroxide at home put Neosporin on, we never know. Actually, what we tend to see is more the intense injury, like the ear is ripped. The eyeball is bitten out, I've seen that happen. Uh, a canine tooth is avulsed because they grabbed around the face and literally ripped the canine tooth out. I mean, that's a, that's a serious injury. And if as a veterinarian or veterinary technician and shelter care worker, because you're seeing this happen in the shelter at times too, two dogs walking past each other suddenly get in a fight, you do not understand that these, you know, a putting out an eyeball, a rip through the ear is actually level four going up to level five. And you don't know anything about these bite levels. You are actually lacking information to help stop this injury and damage and improve the welfare for the animals as well as help prevent, you know, further injury. So everybody, Everybody should download this Dr. Ian Dunbar's bite level scale. And every shelter have this posted everywhere where there's dogs and hand these out to your clients so that everyone is speaking from the same language. So in shelter care, in veterinary practice, dog trainers, because so often, even within shelters and even within veterinary practices, it may be like, oh, it's not a big deal. It was just a little puncture on the neck yeah, from a medical point of view, but from a behavioral side, that dog is ready to really create some injury on the other dog. That's a serious problem. So the aggressing dog must be always kept separate from this other dog, or we now have to get this family into a behavior consult. Like maybe I stitched up the ear, right? But now that veterinarian really needs to say, look, this is serious, you must get together with a behaviorist and separate these two dogs until we know better. Maybe I'm gonna go ahead and start medication as I gotta do something now to help improve this. Don't have, I don't have the time or I don't have the expertise to do a full consultation, but I must do something. I wanna liken, you know, relate this level three bite, and all of you out there <laughs> in the veterinary medical field, I, I'm, I'm speaking a lot to you, and I think those in the non-medical field can, okay, follow along with this. But to me, when I, when I got this piece of information, which I thought, you know, yeah, I was pretty right, you know, but boy, it really validated it for me with Dr. Feltis's paper, is when seeing a level three bite, even if it's a few puncture holes and it's easy to flush and clean, to me, or how I see that is the same as 
Somebody brings in a urine sample because their dog is urinating around the house a bit, has had some accidents. They go, oh, I guess he must have an infection, you know? And so they bring in just the urine sample. Okay, so I'm getting, it's not a big complaint. I'm getting a urine sample, or they bring the dog and the urine sample in. Weight's normal, looks normal. How's eating? Oh, fine. We run the urine sample, and we find a two plus glucose in the urine, and the concentration now is getting a bit dilute. And the first thing I'm going to say is, whoa, do we have an early diabetic here? That could be diabetes brewing. We must do blood work. What exactly is this dog eating? Let's get him on a high fiber diet. Uh, and then after I get that at least checked, know the blood sugar level, know the potassium level, know the liver value levels, then I'm going to address either, okay, we're not in full diabetes yet, but we want to prevent it from happening. Let's stop feeding the table food. Let's get them on this high fiber diet, right? Let's get the exercise up. Or I get the blood work back and I'm, whoa, the blood sugar is 350. Maybe it's time to start the insulin. I would intervene immediately. I would be very clear to my client, this is a life-threatening disease. If we do not take care of this now, this will get worse. The liver is going to get involved. You know, it's going to cause damage to the kidneys. I know medically all those things going on. Well, in behavior now, we need to look at the same way. We got a level three bite. We immediately must be saying, this will get worse. These dogs will go up to a level of ripping their ear apart or biting out their eyeball, or maybe even worse, dogs kill other dogs. Dogs will lunge up and grab at the jugular and bite hard enough to cause laceration and death. I have seen cases like that happen and many, many veterinarians have had that hor horrible call and we might go, how did this ever come up? I didn't know anything about it. Well, that's maybe because we never knew anything about this and now we do, okay? So bite level, make sure we're all talking the same language with our bite level scales and then We'll go on with pairing. Now, one other thing I want to say about this bite level scale. This is what a lot of people will say, and that's why it's so important. We're all using a document written by a boarded veterinarian behaviorist. We studied a lot on bite and bite intensity. So we understand these bite levels, and we are not disagreeing about did it matter, did it not matter, oh, it wasn't really a bite. Okay, first level bite. I'm going to go through the bite levels right now. The first level bite, level one. This is a sometimes called a pre-bite or snap, meaning the dog has jumped up and he attempted to bite and either, either the dog didn't, he, you know, you see the dogs are like chomp, chomp, chomp in the air. They're not, you could be standing there where he could have come closer to actually have bitten you, but he didn't. He's showing some level of inhibition, okay? There's a little bit of, I'll pull back. I'm really still heavily warning you now. Okay, it could be that or it could be in the moment of you walking past a dog and the dog suddenly jumps up and attempts to bite, but because you continue to move, you got out of the way. So you didn't get bitten. And so you're like, oh, what was that? Oh, okay. No, hey, that, pay attention. That dog is trying to bite you. That dog has gone all the way up that ladder of anxiety, now shifted over to aggression, and his intention is to bite. So it counts. That level one bite does count, meaning pay attention to it. Think of we've got to remove the triggers. We have a serious problem, you know, et cetera. Do not ignore that. Do not discount that. Now, a lot of people do. So this is why we're here today. <laughs> Let's, that does count as a bite attempt. Now, the second level, a near bite is where the tooth has actually made contact with the skin. Sometimes we'll call this an inhibited bite. The dog is doing, you know, grabbing and then letting go or just touching with the mouth and letting go. Again, a little bit of credit to the dog because the dog, while intending to bite, is showing some inhibition to the bite. In other words, he's like, yeah, I'll stay a bit on warning, but I'm warning you a little more seriously now. I'm gonna grab on. This is not play, grabbing onto the sleeve and grabbing on around the neck with each other. It's actually that level two bite going on in many instances. A lot of people will assume it's play, or it doesn't matter because it didn't break the skin. And remember, if we're out here in wintertime we're, and the dog is grabbing my arm and I'm wearing two sweaters, of course he won't break the skin. He may have a force and tension hard enough to be a level three, but my clothing protected it. So also, how, like, how firm is the dog grabbing? Is he hanging on? 
once they're hanging on and they're firm, now they're going up to level three. And we do need to, when we're getting these bite histories, if the bite happened in January right now, oh, no, the skin didn't get broken. Okay, hold on a second here. Were you wearing a down jacket? Did you have a thick sweatshirt on or a sweater on? Well, of course the skin won't be broken. So we wouldn't classify, well, the dog was really hanging on pretty good. That would be classified as a level three because of jaw pressure and you had protective clothing. And the level three now, of course, is usually when we have skin punctures, okay? Now, dogs don't wear clothing around each other, and we're talking about housemate aggression now. So when the puncture happens, there's more pressure from the jaw and the mouth onto the skin and lack of inhibition. So, I, I, I really want to bite you. That's what the dog is saying. I'm going to come right in. I'm going to bite hard enough that my teeth are going to puncture through your skin. And this may be down to... I think a third of the, or a quarter of the length of the canine tooth, whatever. You've got a puncture and you can see it. Let's put it that way. And there may be multiple, usually there's one. That's level three. But even at that level three, for a dog, you see how far this dog now has ascended, has increased the intensity to do damage. That's what this is all about for the dog. I want to really hurt you. So you back off and you get away from me. That's what the dog is saying. So to be at a level where they will bite hard enough to inflict puncture and damage that is significant. Now the next level up at level four is gonna be multiple bites or a deeper bite with pulling and tearing. That's where you get the torn ear, that's where you get the laceration or even holding on. And then of course level five, so level four is a serious bite, a very serious bite. This is where usually it's level four when they're coming into the veterinarian for care, sometimes at level three, but more at level four. And then very serious, is there are multiple bites on the body and this is also where you're going to see level five you're going to see the dog going at vital structures they're going to be going up at the neck for the jugular they're going to be going at the eyes because that's signaling social signaling you know at the eyes they're going to be going at the abdomen these are the dogs who grab another dog by the abdomen and rip it open and eviscerate the dog their intention is to kill the victim dog and so that is extremely serious and that one rarely, if ever, can be managed or controlled, you know, in a home. So know the bite, not only know the bite levels, have these handouts so that you can refer to them and hand them out to the people you're having and communicate with so we don't have any disagreement and everybody's using the same language, okay? That's really, really important and really helpful. In veterinary practices and shelters, level three, means we are not going to be able to have a really safe dog around another dog. It's going to be really difficult for this dog to always be safe around another dog. Okay, that's the prognostic risk factor there. Okay, gender pairing. Let's talk about that. In the study, and I would definitely agree based on my life experience, female spade to female spade was the highest aggressing uh, pair. Male to male, female to female, sorry, female to male, male to male, less or so. Now, <clears throat> while intact female to intact female was a lower amount, intact male to intact male is also a lower amount. Something we really have to keep in mind here in the United States is the majority of our dogs are neutered. So we do know in an intact female, she definitely increases in her aggression and um, in aggressive behaviors when she's going through her heat cycle and that heat cycle actually starts up about two weeks before she shows any blood so we can see and, it, and I'm starting I've seen a couple cases where these younger female dogs are not getting spayed by like five months six months of age because of possible orthopedic or health considerations there are some recommendations now to not neuter these dogs so young and what we have, I'm seeing is some of these female dogs going through their first heat in a multi-dog household now suddenly really rising up to aggress on the older dog where there might have been mild dog tension before. Now this female dog is rising straight up and going straight for the neck and the jugular. They're going to a level four bite. And if you have another female in the home, the the one usually unspayed female will go seriously, you know, aggressively like a level four onto the other adult female. And sometimes the other adult female comes right back at a level four or five. And we have some very serious injuries happening and those two cannot live together. So I think we need to keep in mind the effect of neutering is not really clear. 
because we don't have a good comparative population of unneutered to neutered, especially two unneutered males together, you know, versus two neutered males together. But by and large, female spade to female spade is the worst pairing. So for shelters, when families are coming in to adopt a dog, really ask them about gender. What's the gender of the existing dog? And go for an opposite gender when adopting out. If you have a female, you want to go for a male. And uh, if you have a male established, you could take on a female or you could take on a male. Okay, size difference, that three pound difference. Doesn't sound like a lot, but it sure makes a difference in the dogs. And, um, you know, three pounds on the body weight of a dog, especially in our little breeds, <laughs> that's a lot of difference. If you have a 10 pound Yorkie, and I don't mean, we're not talking about overweight obese dogs in the weight difference necessarily, but if accommodated for normal, you know, normal frame, normal size, normal weight, and we have a three pound difference. If you have a 10 pound normal weighted Yorkie or Cairn Terrier, and now we have a 13 pound, Yorkie or Cairn Terrier, that's a 30% increase in body weight. If we have a 20 pound, you know, 20 pound dog and a 23 pound dog, now we're getting up to like a 15% difference in body weight, which is actually pretty significant for the size of the frame, for the amount of musculature when they do this body slamming, jumping up, pinning down, and then even the intensity, how strong their jaw is and biting down. Breed also matters with this in terms of size of the jaw, size of, you know, size of the jaw and strength of the bite. Size matters also, even if we have two large breed dogs that are kind of close in size, true, if one of the dogs is, you know, not more than three pounds less than the other dog, but two German Shepherds will oftentimes create more damage onto each other because of the size of their mouth, the strength of their jaw, and the size of the canine teeth as compared to two chihuahuas that get in a fight. Yes, there is a greater responsibility on the large breed dog owner for managing housemate aggression, just like there is a larger degree of responsibility to the large breed dog owner for reducing and managing any canine aggression to an unknown person or canine aggression in any other situation because the bigger the dog the bigger the bite that is always true okay um i really i was so excited when this article came out last february i called dr feltis's office she was in appointments and i just said oh my gosh thank you so much now our veterinary practices, especially emergency practices, have some numbers that we can make a very strong case for, we've got to stop this behavior now. This isn't like, oh, well, maybe go here, go there. And this is, this is not a training issue. This is a behavior issue. You have to see, especially with aggression, a veterinarian with special interest or specialty in behavior now. We can't mess with this. It's going to get worse. Okay, this really, I think, gives, um, it's a fact, okay? It's a, it's a piece of information that gives a lot of validity, and I feel confidence, and I hope confidence, to our veterinarians and veterinary technician staff when they're talking on the phone to people and they know, whoa, level three, hold it, whoa, we got a bad problem, that they can say that with confidence, and they can say it will get worse, and say that with confidence as well. Um, if you want to download the article, I did put the link on my Facebook post earlier today, but it's the JAVMA, the Journal of the American Veterinary Medical Association, February 2020, uh, and it's Dr. Feltes, so that's F-E-L-T-E-S, Dr. Heron, H-E-R-R-O-N, Dr. Haig, H-A-U-G, and Dr. Schull, S-H-U-L-L. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. I really appreciate you coming to these Facebook Lives. Um, just a few other announcements. I have, I've had to reschedule my puppy uh, behavior, my puppy problem behavior seminar and workshop shop day uh, to March 28th, Sunday, March 28th. I've uh, updated the post on the Facebook page, updated my um, website, and I hope you can attend that. I'm actually going to do it as a hybrid. Our numbers are starting to, are decreasing here in Illinois, and we can do some small group on-site learning here, so I'm going to do it as the four presentations, 
For those who are here, I'll do that live, and then we'll get into the workshop. For those of you who want to take it hybrid, part online, part live, you'll get the four recorded you know, presentations, which I want you to take ahead of then the live stream afternoon handling and puppy you know, ma behavior management in class workshop and how to do a puppy consult and question and answer you know, session. Uh, I look forward to seeing you there. Um, I'm going to also watch my website on the event page because I am working together with a couple other veterinarians um, and some veterinary technicians for other full day seminars here at the Bella Behavior Learning Center, not only focused on behavior, but also on integrative medicine. A good friend of mine, Dr. Susan Albright, does a lot of educating and speaking on essential oils, acupuncture and chiropractic. Um, uh, Dr. Shauna Garner is a leading expert in the use of tele, tele everything, <laughs> telecommunications, telehealth, telemedicine for providing not only veterinary exams, but also after hours triage service, legalities, and then these various platforms on how to make it easy. So having, uh, we're going to do a seminar day on how to use tele, you know, telecommunications and not lose your mind in veterinary medicine because we really need to help our clients embrace this and how to make it easy for the clients to embrace it as well as for ourselves to use it because it's still very intense in practice right now and I don't think that's going to change very soon. Um, and some other ones coming up as well. Thank you very much. I appreciate your support. Make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel, Dr. Sally J. Foote, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.